a garage band named Chad Allen and the Expressions came up with this great sound back in 1965. The song is Shaken All Over. That was before the band changed their, their name to the Guess Who. You might remember that tune. We're talking with Tom DeLong of Angels and Airwaves and Blink-182 about his project Secret Machines. And we're getting into the good stuff about these uh, these people from behind the scenes that he met who've been sharing information with him. I guess the obvious questions: how do we know they're telling him the truth? How do we know that uh, this stuff can be verified? And where is it all leading? What effect does this have on the push for full disclosure on the UFO topic? We'll get into all of that and more in this hour on Coast to Coast AM. Tom, before the break, I mentioned that your pitch, uh, you were making these folks as you move from one source to the next, up the food chain, so to speak, uh, your pitch gets better. And what is the basic message? What, what are you telling them that you can offer that hasn't been offered to them before? Um, I, I think for the first time, somebody coming in that has a pretty serious academic background on the subject of the UFO phenomenon, somebody that also has, you know, a recognizable um, name and uh, a specific type of voice that speaks to a specific demographic, um, also somebody that comes in with with you know tremendous amount of respect and um, modesty when with dealing with these guys. I'm not just some kind of Hollywood prick, <laughs> you know. I, uh, I'm treating the material the way it needs to be treated, at least with my first conversations with these guys. Um, and then lastly, you know, once they gave me a, a little bit, I executed exactly the way I said I would. And um, I think that kept building in their minds, you know, a, a, gr- a great case to work with me. So they they dribbled something out to see how you'd handle it. They did. They would dribble it out, and I would say, uh, you know, I would take it, I would incorporate it, I would make sure that I that I run everything by them, like I said that I would. I would tell them that when you know, I would say, you know, that we're doing this piece of nonfiction. Here's the first couple chapters. Remember, I told you I was doing that. Or here, the novel. You know, we talked about the novel. I want you to read the first part of the novel, um, sir. Is it okay if I do it this way or 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 this? And 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 it just kept going and going and going. And then I then you know what really I think clinched it was you know. Actually, I should back up here. When I when I got connected to the general, that was a big, big breakthrough. And um, before I talk a little bit more about how I got, you know, I got more trust from these guys. Um, what happened was, is I was up at NASA Ames. You know, I got connected to a very specific person, and that person had me fly out and meet them. So this is where it gets really interesting. Uh, so I go out to a certain city, and I land at the airport, and I walk through security, and I meet this person. Um, The person takes me uh, to a restaurant that's right past security, and I go to the back of the the restaurant. There's nobody in that area, and we sit at a booth for two hours. And while we're sitting there, he leans across the table, and this is the the first, very first words that were said to me. It was the Cold War. And every single day, we lived under the threat of nuclear war. Every single day, we believed and really thought in the deepest part of our souls that nuclear war could happen at any given moment. And then he stops. And he goes, and somewhere in those years, and he looked me in the eye, he goes, we found a life form. And everything that we did and every decision that we made with that life form was because of the consciousness at that time. And I said, sir, you know, when taking into account things that this life form has done, for example, turning our nuclear weapons on and readying them for launch, and then he interrupts me, puts a finger in my face and says, there are heroes in Russia, heroes. And under grave risk to himself and to his country, they did not fire back. And at that moment, I realized I was, it already started this this new game I was in uh, of of working with people in like a dance of words and information was already coming. He, I mean, there, there was, it was no, uh, <laughs> there was no like small talk. Like we didn't just sit down and just say, Hey, let's, let's have a beer and let's like get to know each other. Um, so let's jump so back sitting, to that. Let, let's jump back to that conversation. 
it was the Cold War. I mean, he's right. given you sort of the the setting for how the cover up or what we'd call the cover up began. Yeah, so this is very important for people to remember. And this is this is this is where I'm so excited to start chopping down all these pathetic conspiracies that I was involved in as well, you know. It, it was the Cold War. We really he's saying that every day they they really thought about the annihilation of all mankind with these, you know, weapons that were hundreds or thousands of times bigger than what we dropped on Japan and we had 20,000 each of those things. And all of a sudden, something falls on the on their laps that's just extraordinary, you know. But even even further than that, if you really hear what I'm saying about the nuclear weapons, the UFOs were turning our weapons on, and and just so Russia could pick up that we're firing our missiles and fire theirs first. It was a big chess game. So these guys went into complete secrecy to start coming up with a defense system against this phenomenon. Now, you know, I, I try to tell people some, some analogies on this. Imagine if someone from the CIA came to your house and sat on your couch and says, hey, I want to tell you about that nuclear weapon uh, that they tried to smuggle in through Canada uh, two months ago. And I also want to tell you about this, you know, virus that uh, almost got released in Los Angeles. And I want to, you know, all these, cra- I, they're not going to do that. Because they're going to be busy trying to figure out how to find the people that did it or, or, to, or to seal off the borders or to come up with a game plan to get better defensive measures across our, you know, our country and whatever they're doing. They, that's how this is. That's how big this issue is. They're not worried about if you and I totally understand because they're too busy trying to understand it and come up with a way to defend against it. And, um, and at the same time, they really want people to understand this, to know these things, but they don't want it to mess up their efforts. Uh, the, 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 more, the more that I started to find out, I, I thought it was a pretty heroic tale that these were really good men and women. Do you know that in that first conversation that I had with that general, uh, during the two hours – I mean I didn't even leave the airport. I was in this back booth, and then I would get, go to security, get on a plane, and go right back home. It was it was crazy meeting, but uh, during that – he must have brought up what was best for the rep- quote best for the republic best for the free republic he brought that up probably 8 different times it's very 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 important to these men what is best for the f- for for the united states as a free country free thinking man and the republic of, that we built they're not these they're not these crazies running around trying to war they're not warmongers you know um very smart this person has multiple PhDs, and I, I wish I could tell you what who he is and what he, he – there was nobody above him. There's nobody, maybe, maybe a couple. But it, when you look at the divisions of how the Department of Defense works and this specific division, um, it, it, it's – it's just extraordinary that I have this contact. So I started using that as much as I could. So I said – so taking it from that point – we talked for two hours, and I said, sir, I need an advisory committee, and we walk through what I need and, and why. And so he went out and got the advisors for me. Um, what, got really, what was really interesting about this is that I started getting advisors that were in different areas, you know, people that deal with space, people that deal with intelligence, people that deal with biowarfare, um, stuff that you wouldn't necessarily think I should need, but I got them, you know. Uh, and, and now I had the ability to start pulling these people together. And I had this one really interesting contact out in Washington, DC that was connected to the, to, to the highest levels of government. That's how I can say it. And so I was able to pull off a coup in, in regards to what anybody in this field has ever been able to pull off, which was a conversation with not only my advisors, um, the most important group of the advisors and somebody representing basically the highest levels of the land and talking about how do we do something to help the youth understand that this is a reality, but th- th- that they're doing really good work and and they could use the empowerment. They could use these the 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 the, the 
citizens of the United States and the world understanding why it's been kept secret and that they, they're not doing it out of uh, malicious reasons. They're doing it because it's an ongoing task. It's an ongoing issue, and they don't fully understand it yet, but they're trying their hardest and spending lots of money and have the brightest minds that they can find, and they're building things, and they're, and they're having breakthroughs that um, I think, frankly, we would all be in- incredibly proud of as a nation of what they've done. Um, you know, obviously, it's a spin. You know, they're they're telling you a version that they want told, but you, it's a story you wanted to tell. It's part of your pitch to them is, look, you guys look bad, especially to young people who think there's been a cover-up on this subject. Uh, people are demanding full disclosure. There's a, a growing movement and a growing call for that. You guys painted yourself into a corner, and it's time to look for a way out, and this is one. So, I mean, obviously, you're, you're concerned that uh, – you're being used, aren't you? Well, you, you know what? People have asked me that, and let me, I'll say no, and let me tell you why. Because I sought these people out, and I asked them a very direct question, and I get a very direct answer. There is no like, hey, why don't you say this? Have you ever thought of this? And just I don't get information for no reason at all. It's a very formal approach the way I do things. Um, you know, uh, I'll say, why has it been kept secret? I'll say, uh, you know, in the book, the the craft that our pilot character learns how to fly is a real craft. And so I'll say, sir, I'm I need guidance on the science of this, and I will get that answer back. You know, and uh, it's not I never I never get information that I don't specifically ask for. So this whole project is not meant to sell people on the idea that this should – oh, this stuff's real. Sorry, I said a bad word. I'm, hopefully we got that delay set up yeah. here. I am still me, but uh, you know, I don't go in here, and, and I'm, not, I'm not trying to make this, uh, this project convince people of the reality of the phenomenon. I'm doing a project to tell people the reasons it's been kept secret and what has happened, what they're dealing with, you know, the breakthroughs that we had, and, and I think – the specific things that I've always wanted to know, you know, and if I think everybody learns these things, they're going to feel a hell of a lot more proud about our country and about the Department of Defense and what they're doing, because this one subject deals with religion, cosmology, you know, physics, science, secrecy, uh, the way we run our country, the relationships we have with other countries, relationships we have with other countries we're not supposed to have relationships with, but we actually kind of still do because of this issue and that stuff's empowering that's really empowering to know you know for the whole next generation of people that are going to grow up and take over all these countries when we're all long gone i I think that uh, this is this kind of subject can unify in so many areas beyond so many other you know other subjects that are out there did you get the sense that uh, this group had ever met before had uh, you know had a sort of the uh, the gathering or the conference call or had was in regular communication the main, uh, the main, you know, who I refer to as the general, I know uh, has dealings with all these people, at, most of them out of the 10 uh, at certain times. Some of them know. Um, some of, a few of them I got through uh, different routes. Um, the way I look at it, you know, it's interesting that when you look at the way the government is set up when it goes into subjects like this, and you look at the way uh, it's managed, it makes perfect sense. So, you know, we we all grew up in this topic thinking, you know, Majestic 12 and the secret shadow government. It's not really like that. Now, there's you have groups within the military that are doing R&D, that are coming up with and analyzing intelligence. So, you know, the, the National Reconnaissance Office will analyze the entire electromagnetic spectrum of space, and, and they'll see things buzzing around and doing stuff. They take that down. Then, you know, the Air Material Command will, you know, look at that stuff and say, okay, what do we build to defend against that? Then the research labs will say, 
okay, well, this is how we'll build it. Um, you know, and then the CIA will have a bunch of guys that are just analyzing, you know, abduction reports or cattle mutilations or other things that are happening in the real world. You know, and all these divisions are all doing their own stuff, and there's probably a very, very, very small group of people that are sitting at the top and putting it all together. Um, I was told that uh, I said, I asked a very specific question. I was, sir, this is exactly, you know, it's funny because I, I, I talk that way, but I, I literally said that. I go, I go, sir, is there anybody standing back and looking at the big picture? You have abductions. You have cattle mutilations. You have, um, you know, spacecraft zipping through orbit. Um, you know, you have these crashes. You have, you have all these things. And at one point it was, no, it's a grab bag of scientists. Nobody's looking at the big picture, which is really interesting to me because, I wonder if, you know, and I don't know all the answers yet, and I'm still taking my time asking the right questions, um, but it makes me almost feel like, you know, some crazy things happened back in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, and we we put together a, a really strong effort to study the stuff, but I think that most of the stuff has been out of reach, so we we, we don't have some major you know, MJ-12 program per se, I, I think we have many programs that are dealing with different aspects of this when they happen, when a crash may happen. I, let me tell you a conversation I had. So I flew out to Colorado Springs, which is where uh, Air Force Space Command is, and also the Air Force Academy. And I was sitting on the deck of a, of a very highly ranked person, and uh, and then we brought in – this is one of my advisors, and then we brought in another advisor that was uh, – a, a, <laughs> I wish I, I'm trying to figure out ways to tell who these guys are, but of the highest rank again. And they said, well, what do you – you know, I, I said I'm, I'm going to be talking about some crash – the crashes in the 40s. There was a pause, and he says, why just the 40s? You know, gets you thinking oh. a little bit. And, then, I, and then, I, then they said, well, what do you need? And I said, well, I think I need someone from the Defense Intelligence Agency. And they said, Why? And I say, well, you know, I don't want to make anyone angry. I, I'm not looking to piss anyone off. I'm not looking to ruffle feathers, break a story. I, I think if I do my project correctly, it'll do good. And they take a pause, and they're looking at me, and now I'm kind of going, well, what did I say wrong? And one guy says, do you go ask your dad for permission after your mother already gave it to you? And I said, no, what do you mean? And then he says, you've been given permission. Now shut the F up and get to work. And it was very serious. And I had these two guys, once again, you can count the stars on their shoulders, <laughs> staring at me, uh, that, that I realized, oh, my God. You know, that's when I realized two other people that I met that were working with me, uh, where, who they really were. You know, like not just by their rank, but who they really were in, in context to what this, the whole UFO subject is. So um, it's an exciting place to be, but it's, it's a little nerve-wracking. We mentioned in the beginning about John Podesta. Now, you've, you've interviewed Podesta. That's public information. That's publicly known. Uh, I don't know if you're saying that he's one of your advisors, but if so, that would be the only name uh, that, that has been known. But I, I wanted to point out, um, as far as political and partisan connections, he would be the only one linked to any candidate or office holder uh, in, in your group, right? The <clears throat> John Podesta is in my documentary uh, and my docu series. I think that he's, I think he's somebody that everybody needs to watch. That's all I'm going to say. And, and like I said before, I, I have in my mind. Uh, you said there's no MJ12 type organization. I have in my mind a, a smoke filled room, and it's like Spectre from the James Bond movie. But there's no, there's no meetings. Hey, everybody, let's get together. You're MJ1. You're MJ2. That doesn't happen. It's compartmentalization, which is pretty much what you'd expect to happen with a topic like this. Right. And, and I, I'm not going to say that I don't know if there is a group of 12 guys, 10 guys, 20 guys that manage all of it. it I haven't asked that specific question yet. I've asked a lot of questions uh, in the docuseries. You're going to start to see all those. I'm going to start presenting out presenting all that stuff and laying it out, um, you know, in chronological order, and people are going to learn a hell of a lot. Uh, but I haven't asked 
is there a small group that manages this other than what I told you a few minutes ago where I said, you know, is anybody standing back and looking at the big picture? It seems to me that, uh, you know, you got to look. You got to think about this UFO phenomenon. Um, hold on, I'm, hold on a moment, Tom. That's the Foo Fighters. That's what people used to call UFOs before they called them UFOs or UAP, UAPs. Is the Foo Fighters back with more of uh, Tom DeLong's disclosures here, including some of the big picture stuff? Who are these visitors? Where are they from? What are they up to? Whatever you can tell us. Coming up next on Coast to Coast. White Houses, the animals from 1968, that band's still out touring around. I think they're coming to Las Vegas soon. We're talking with Tom DeLong about this uh, amazing journey he's on, pe- speak, people he is speaking to in and uh, out of government who are sharing uh, information with him about the, the inner workings of what we would all characterize as the UFO cover-up. The idea of full disclosure, do we need to know all this stuff? How much does he know? What's the big picture? Going to get into that in the next segment here on Coast to Coast AM. Tom, as a guy who's followed this topic for a long time, you know about disinformation. You know the the history of the topic, how certain researchers have been led to believe that they're about to get some real solid stuff. I think Linda Howe was promised some video of a landing. Uh, Robert Emenegger, his uh, film project years ago, we're going to give you the goods, the video of the landing. We're going to tell you the whole story. You know about the... uh, you know, the disinformation uh, in New Mexico, and uh, a lot of people don't think that the MJ-12 documents were created as part of a, a plot to confuse the Russians. How do you know you're not being used or led down a path? I think that's a good question. Um, number one, you know, these guys didn't search me out. I haven't had, in my advisory group, I haven't had anybody that just kind of came out of nowhere and says, hey, I really want to give you something. It didn't work that way. It was through really interesting channels of how I met them, and some of which I've built relationships with um, that are very close and came from very kind of, you know, in very sanitized ways, you know, where where I think, uh, you know, people wouldn't suspect that they don't have a they don't have a vet, an interest in lying to me they're not if i was working with a big group from an intel from the cia i would be very weary of of it but my all of my guys are um they're the channels that they work in i should say guys and girls but the the places that they work and the divisions that they work in are more science based uh, engineering based um, in defense based and, uh, and, and something else I can't say, but they're, so they're not necessarily a professional spooks who deal with, uh, exactly. stirring the pot and misleading people. Uh, exactly. how, you know, they're real though. You, you've checked but, out the, the credentials, oh, yeah. you know, that no, they no, work no, in I, the places. Oh, absolutely. Cause I've been to the places <laughs> and, um, and I've, you know, I even attempted to read, um, you know, I, I attempted to read something that one of these guys did, and it was like 20 pages of equations that I literally, you would think it's a joke. It, it, it was somebody's, uh, is what they did there. When you get your PhD, you got to do your, your, what do you call it? The dissertation or whatever it's called. I don't know what it's called, but yeah. I, I, it's just, an, it's insanity, the level of how these guys operate. <clears throat> but, um, you know, I, but I don't want to say they're not an intelligence it's just the type of the intelligence arm that they're in is not counterintelligence based it's it's uh i don't want to say that what it is but it's space intelligence it's what, a, what and what is the uh, operating agreement what agreement do you have with them you don't reveal their names or personal information about them and and uh, you have to do you have to clear uh the stuff that you release absolutely and i ask for permission I, uh, I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to say who they are. I'm not going to, um, you know, ever put at risk, you know, uh, anything that they, and also too, by the way, things they tell me that I have, I have to release a certain way respectfully and, um, in drips, like, you know, I set up a bunch of parameters of how I will put the information into this project and how I will, um, put it out there so it does a couple things. It doesn't scare people, and it gets traction with uh, young adults. That's that, that's a very important point. You know what you're up against, though. People will say, well, look, this guy's a rock musician. Um, 
they're not going to tell this stuff to him or or they're going to tell him stuff that they have plausible deniability. I mean, part of that is the appeal, right? That uh, if they wanted to, if this goes wrong, they can discredit you or deny it. Well, they can do that to anybody. I mean, they do that to presidents. <laughs> you know, they uh, it, you're talking about, um, you know, levels of power that we can't comprehend as civilians. So I'm not I, I frankly, I don't care if anyone, um, you know, doesn't believe me. I just, I'm in the middle of something very important. I just got to do what I said I'll do. But I, and and uh, and I think if I do it right, it's going to have some really good effects and hopefully ignite, um, you know, other things that can happen within this discussion. But um, you know, plausible deniability is something the government has always done, and it's the way they operate, especially when they want to put out very serious information. Uh, with, with this topic, what they've done is they would leak things over the past 60 years and create ridicule for the people that may believe it. That way, everyone kind of hears the stuff. You hear about the Roswell crash, but you're not really scared about it because the chances are it might not be real, but maybe it could be real. You know, but Like Area 51, point, flying saucers it, out at uh, S-4. Yeah, exactly. It's all that stuff they want you to know. The reason we talk about it is because they chose for us to hear about it. And, uh, and the reason we kind of laugh it off is because they, by design, that's how they do it. Um, but they want people to know. They want, the, you know, they don't like the fact that they have to do all of this without people knowing how, what they're doing and how hard they're working at it. And, um, you know, I, I was, uh, what I said, to a few of them, I was like, do you know what this would do? It would change who we elect in office. It would change the amount of money we appropriate and allocate to these these programs. We would have the biggest uh, space program that we've ever had, thousands of times bigger than Apollo, and it would be part defense and it would be part exploration, and people would run to be a part of it and help. It would be like the day after 9-11 where everyone wanted to sign into the military. If people knew what the stakes were, if they just knew what you know, what these guys are telling me, and it, once people know this stuff, and if it really caught fire and everyone knew it that, that this was real, it would completely be. It would change everything. It would just change everything. How we operate as a country, how we operate in partnership with other countries, and what our civilization is doing. Because don't forget that yes, we have cracked gravity, and yes, we are building machinery that have anti gravity, and yes. I was told that. It's a big deal. All right, let's talk about some of the stuff you were told that you can share. Um, the biggest question, who are they? I mean, it, I, I think you, I said in the introduction that some people uh, in your group refer to them not as aliens or the visitors, they refer to them as the others. Is there significance in using that term? You know, I, I don't know the significance of the others. Uh, the phenomenon uh, is not used. Aliens is not used. Um, it's the others, and it's and when you're taught the way it's explained to me is that they are gods the, the, with the little g. So the entire UFO phenomenon is about multiple gods that fight amongst themselves and by design factionalize mankind into different religions to step back and let us fight each other. So it has other things that it wants to accomplish and we don't notice them because we're too involved fighting each other so the and they know that so our government knows that our government knows that these that the others are instigating war amongst mankind but the other issue is is that these gods from from you know you got to look back at ancient history and all those stories about gods that came down and did this and that, uh, it, it's all true. So that's the other thing. You gotta, <laughs> and I'll get into that in the docuseries. There's some of that stuff I don't want to get into tonight. But um, the, the, the government is very aware that this intelligence is pitting different countries against each other based on religion um, on purpose. And uh, it's a scary scenario. So it's like it's a multiple it's a multiple front war that we're fighting because now we have to worry about each other and we have to worry about the others so that's part of the reason for the secrecy is not to we don't want um everyone knowing our vulnerabilities and we don't want everyone knowing the advancements we've we we've made to protect everybody against 
multiple adversaries. Well, multiple adversaries, some of them being humans, like the Russians. You mentioned earlier an incident uh, that we've reported some of these kinds of incidents. I, I personally investigated them in Russia about Russian ICBMs being activated after UFOs are over a base that are ready to launch, uh, that somebody else is controlling them. We know that we've had incidents like that in our country. Is it somebody just messing with us? Yeah, it's absolutely. And the scary thing is, and the way it's been told to me, is that we are trying to keep it secret so we don't, um, we don't, you know, get get a, get the conflict. We don't initiate a conflict where other people aren't quote considering the manipulations of the others. So it's like this really touchy dance that we've been doing for 60 years trying to figure out who is being manipulated as a country more than the other you know uh, not the others but we just know that when you look at places you know you got to think about this for example now go back to when bush came out and he's talking about iran and north korea and the axis of evil and that's you know that's our government making a blanket statement that they're really concerned about these areas then you kind of go deeper into the parts of the government that know about the UFO phenomenon, the ones they call the others, the ones that are influencing countries, the ones that are by design or maybe by accident happening to crash a very advanced piece of technology in the country's borders so they make better weapons to fight bigger wars. And we're not the only ones that have had a crash. Yes. And so when we make big statements about North Korea or big statements about Iran or China, it's because we are aware that those places are being manipulated and have very advanced technologies now. So we're trying to keep everyone calm, you know, and not, and not you know, initiate a conflict. So we're looking kind of over our left shoulder and our right shoulder, and at the same time, every once in a while, trying to tell everybody about it, but we can't really tell everybody about it. And I think that um, once people know this, this stuff – in however, whatever form, if, if everyone knew all this stuff, like they came out and told everybody this, uh, you know, from the White House, I just think people would want to help. I think people would say, oh, my God, you know, it's all been secret for completely different reasons than ego-based reasons. Like, they don't want me to know, or, I, you know, I can't handle it, or they think they're better than me. It's like it has nothing to do with it. It's an act of war. So the the overall picture that we get filling in the blanks from what you've said tonight is that uh, something sort of dropped in our laps back at the beginning of the Cold War. And the same kind of thing seems to have dropped in the laps of maybe the Russians and maybe others. And, quote, potentially just to see who is stronger. And that's a scary thing. That's, quote, <laughs> we, and, and we don't know. But that's what we're, we're – that's literally how these guys have to think. They have it's like a multi-level chess game or something. It, that's exactly what it is. It's a multi-level chess game, and they have to sit back and go, are, you know, what is the reason they just happen to have had a crash here? What is the reason there's, so, there's a huge religious war going on right now? You know, what is the reason that all of a sudden you know, China's defense budget has quadrupled in the past few years? It's all these things, and, and I think that creates a pretty – a pretty stressful picture, um, and and the other thing is too, they don't, for the, they can't come out and tell everybody that all all these religions that are firing all over the planet for the past thousands of years are based off things they saw in the sky, you know, it's like that's gonna that's gonna hit hit hard at home for a lot of people. It's gonna be hard to hard to digest. You know, Charles Fort, the uh, the uh, founder of the Fortian movement, he he had a statement that he. He said after all the years of strange stories that he collected, he feels that we're property. And then uh, I remember just as, as an adjunct to that, uh, right when I first started chasing these mysteries, there was a book called Gods of Eden by a guy named William Bramley who wrote it and then just kind of went away. which sort of painted the picture that we are, uh, we are like cattle. We're an agricultural product. If you wanted to know why there might be reasons why some of the big pictures kept from us, I mean, people say they're ready for to know the full picture. I'm I'm not sure they are. Yeah, I I don't know if people are either. Um, I I do know, and as of two weeks ago, 
you know, we all had suspicions about cattle mutilations being involved with the phenomenon. I do know that, yes, absolutely they are. And, I mean, just a couple of days they found, you know, whatever, 10 or 20 elk lined up in the snow with all the, their jaws cored up and their, mam you know, their genitals all cut out and the blood was missing. And the same exact thing that's been happening for, for decades. And that's, that's creepy. That's demonic. That's evil, weird scientific dark stuff going on and it's been happening for a very long time and um you know it's i think it would scare people that we might be property we might be you know harvested we yeah i, I you got to look at the big picture is that w what's happening right now is everyone believes something different about god and we're all killing each other over it and we all have an advanced weaponry based off crashes that just happen to fall on our borders and then, when we're, while we're doing that, these things are zipping around and doing weird things with animals, doing weird things with people and abductions, and they're they're off, you know, trying to accomplish something. Um, you know, you and I have had discussions about the pain and and the anger and the emotional energy of all the war. Maybe there's something there that is you know, is something that they're interested in, the emotional side of things, and which is hard to think of, but it's still energy, you know. I can hear people uh, sort of gnashing their teeth and, and thinking, well, this can't be true, therefore it isn't, which is sort of the same approach a lot of people have taken to UFOs in general. I don't think it's true, therefore I'm not going to give it any thought, and it can't be true, and so I've made up my mind. I, I, I get the feeling you're going to run into a lot of that. You might. You know, or I might, <laughs> but uh, I didn't. I'm not doing this. I'm not. I'm not stupid. You know, I didn't walk off a gigantic rock and roll stage that was really easy living <laughs> to jump into something that's very dangerous, deals with national security, and meet with a bunch of people in in very clandestine ways to write a bunch of very expensive, labor-intensive books and make a a bunch of risky movies um, with a bunch of people in Hollywood that are frankly sometimes hard to get along with because it's a different culture than I'm used to. I didn't do all of that because I'm dumb. You know, I didn't do all of it for fame. I didn't. I, I and so people have to realize that. Um, you know, and I think a lot of my fans know this stuff. They know that that um, when I'm into something, I jump in head first. You know, and I go all the way with it. This is got to be the most important thing I've ever done. And and if, if it works the way that I think it can work, it, it could be paradigm shifting. You know, I was talking to someone the other day whom uh, you connected me with about getting it, creating a user-generated um, way to ask my advisors questions from the people who so badly want answers that have been studying this stuff for decades like myself. I've asked some very, very big questions, but um, I think getting getting people involved and pushing questions my way to get some answers I think would be really, really cool, and um, I'm looking forward to that. I, I think uh, we're going to open up the phone lines in the next hour, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the nature of secrecy, and I, I don't know how far you're willing to go on that, but you'd agree with, uh, we got like a minute before the break, but you'd agree that some of the things that are kept secret should not be kept secret. There are no legitimate reasons for it, right? Oh, absolutely. I, I definitely I definitely think that. Um, I was told that in the White House, they would stamp, this is in actually in John Podesta's interview, he says we would stamp things top secret just to make sure someone read it, <laughs> you know, because people were so inundated with documents that even in the White House, they would say just put top secret on it, then it'll make sure everyone will read that memo, you know. <laughs> so there's a lot of things that don't need to be secret. Um, you know, when Hillary Clinton was on Jimmy Kimmel the other night saying, hey, let's release all these UFO files except for the ones that have national security implications – well, you, you know, it, I, it's going to be hard. There's going to be a lot of UFO stuff that they can't release because, like I said, it's an active war. You know, it is. It is a war. Um, and it gets hot at times, and it's, and it's something they're dealing with every single day. You know, there's, I was told there's a very interesting story. Um, about 36 months ago, I mean, we're Hold on, hold on. That's, that's a really good one. We're going to uh, – Jimi Hendrix taking us into the break, and when we come back on the other side – 
you know, to tell us a story about something very dramatic that happened 36 months ago. Talk with Tom DeLong. We'll be opening up the phone lines in a bit, and you can uh, ask questions and make comments as well. Stay with us. Out of Knoxville, Tennessee, that's a band called the V-Roys. The song is called Strange. It's a really good tune. Uh, the band was a favorite of critics. Uh, I sure liked them, but uh, they didn't stick around. That's a great song. You ought to check it out sometime. We're talking with Tom DeLong of uh, Angels and Airwaves and Blink-182 about uh, his project, Secret Machines. And we've uh, we've heard a lot of stuff here tonight. Uh, the idea that there is another intelligence operating uh, among us that is referred to as the Others. Uh, that uh, they they sort of mess with us, uh, that um, there are projects and people within government and outside of government that are trying to figure this stuff out. Uh, But uh, the the overall picture is pretty grim. You know, uh, we folks who talk about UFO stuff on a regular basis, you you, the subject of disclosure comes up. Hey, we're ready. We're we're ready. We know we can handle it. Tell us the full story. And, And it makes you wonder. You know, are we really ready for the full story? If the if the truth is that uh, we humans are an agricultural product, um, are we ready to hear that? When we come back, we'll open up the phone lines. Uh, I have one more story I want to hear Tom tell us, and then we'll hear what's on your mind as well here on Coast to Coast AM. So, Tom, before the break, you were going to tell us about something dramatic that happened 36 months ago. What is it? There was... Uh, an alert that went out that all of our nuclear weapons and the, the the weapons that are at the tip of the spear for NATO, so it's all of NATO's weapons, that over a third of them were simultaneously being shut down uh, within our oceans by UFOs that were zipping around and shutting these things down. Um, and I think, you know, what's scary about there there is actually another part of the story and the mechanisms by which that keep a lot of those online uh, come from space, and then those those mechanisms in space were being shut down at the exact same time. So it had to do with space and the oceans. And they put together uh, – I know somebody that had to go into a very secure location – and go through all these different levels of security to go to another hidden location. And there was a guy in a suit that says, you're going to lead an investigation on this and figure out what went wrong. And uh, the the team that was put together for this was like first-year uh, staff, first-year soldiers, like a communication soldier and like a you know, some, en- an enli- some enlisted guy, you know, what? and the whole point was, is that they didn't want to find the answer. So when NATO comes asking and all the countries come asking, like, who's shutting down all of our weapons? They would say, oh, we, we ran an investigation. We had, we had this, you know, this hawk team, hack team that we put together and, um, and you know, figure it really, out. yeah, it's just a big cover, you know, because they're actively working on it. But you know, they don't want people to know what, what what the real work is, you know. You know, what makes me wo- worry even more is that whether it could be the Russians, that they've got some technology that these others gave to them just to mess with us. Well, that is part of the story. And, and it's a very, very specific and clear part of the story that I've been given that I will be communicating. And that will be in the books, but the docuseries, I'll talk about that uh, quite a lot. Um, there is a, a major advancements that Russia has, um, that we have, that China has, based on uh, technology that has either been given by design or given by accident. Um, I personally, from everything I'm hearing, it seems to look like it was given by design. Uh, Once again, like I told you earlier, quote, to see who is the stronger. And that's a a scary thought, you know, to, to, to give weaponry like that and step back and say, now go kill each other and, and we'll work with the ones that are left over. So um, it's a, it, it, like you said it the best. It is this crazy complex game of chess that's going on. You know, I, you know, we've, we've been in this a long time and, and I've been right there pounding the, the, uh, the pulpit uh, along with everybody else saying, we're ready for disclosure. Tell us the truth and this cover up. And you, you have to step back and wonder sometimes uh, is, is that the case? And, and the, the longer people are in this field, some of the colleagues that I, that I work with over the years, the people whose opinions um, I respect the most, all sort of gravitate to that position. Hey, maybe this is not such a good idea because this stuff could be profoundly disturbing to, to get the full picture. That 
that we might be an agricultural product, that there, there is some kind of entity that might as well be a god, uh, or the, you know, I, I'm thinking about the stories of Skinwalker Ranch that that we've written about, where this thing at best is ambivalent, but it, it can do all kinds of stuff. It seems to feed off of fear. It can be very dark and threatening at times. I, I, I remember laughing at people who would say, it's not aliens, it's demons. I, I, I couldn't laugh anymore. I'm not so sure about that. There, there is a very, very strong link between what people think demons are from the Bible and other religions um, and the UFO phenomenon. And what you have is something that doesn't like man, period, and something that feels um, either jealous of or um, has some kind of plan for what man uh, is to be. And... Um, I, I that that just makes it that much worse when you think about it. I have a quote here I should I should read you. Um it says and this is from one of the advisors. Would the link of aliens creating man who then created God to keep us in our place be something worth keeping secret? Mind you, secret with a K, which is how we do secret machines. So I think so. We're talking about the biggest institutions on the planet and the world's major religions. It's bigger than just the big bad US government. And going back to the Greeks, and including Russians and Germans, make it sufficiently global across centuries. Maybe evidence of disappeared ancient cultures, Easter Island, the Maya, the Inca. That's evidence of what happened for those who did not obey, thus encouraging the secret to be kept. And could the story evolve from how men exploited, different groups of men exploited this technology to see how the entire secret is uncovered, rewriting her world history and shattering many of our most well-regarded holy institutions, except this time when they come to wipe us out like the other ones, we are actually ready for them. And that readiness is another example why things have been kept quiet for so long and has been a strange international partnership indeed. But now they're allowing some of it to dribble out. I would hope that some of your advisors are listening tonight. I, I'm telling you that this whole story, and I remember when I got this specific communication, it made me feel m- more empowered. You know, We think that there's like this crazy conspiracy going on and this big cover-up, and maybe to some effect that's what you can call it, but really this is the sequence of events. In Germany, they had some crashes. They started doing some advanced work. In World War II, right after World War II, we had some crashes. Maybe Russia had some crashes. Everyone factionalizes around that period of time. Maybe China had some crashes. We cover the whole thing up. No one really knows about it. But all, what we really did is we went into these, these incredibly secret places underground or whatever these bases are, places that are out in Nevada and, and all over the world, and we started working like crazy, with the brightest minds, with huge amounts of money, with uh, just ju- with passion and with uh, resilience and with um, you know uh, everything at our disposal to come up with a way to protect everybody. You know, anti-gravity craft, different weapons and 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 uh, in space, uh, different psychological operations that we play on the public. You know, uh, I think part of the cover-up is a psychological operation, so the UFO occupants themselves still think we know nothing about them. And I think that's part of the plan. It's part of it. You know, everything has been a big chess game to make this the others not know how far along we've gotten to to fight back. And I think that is something people need to know. And once again, I'm going to say it here, you know, I'm going to keep saying the same thing thing over and over again you know the, the i think once people learn this stuff they're going to lose a lot of cynicism about the government let's take a couple of calls uh wild card line rosie in tucson hi rosie you're on with tom DeLong. hi george thank you for having me and tom i just want to say um i've been uh seems now like a lifelong fan of you i followed your entire career and you're actually one of the people that really got me interested in the um, whole phenomenon or whatever you want to call it. Um, so I've been really interested in everything that you've been doing lately. But um, I wanted to ask you a question about your camping experience that you talked about in the beginning, saying um, your your um, experiment that you did, which 
I'm very familiar with the meditation, the, um, I guess they call it the CE5. And um, I wanted to know if you have done that experience since then, or if you still believe that, you know, it is something relevant or, um, and also if you, if, if what you experienced, do you think it was the others or, you know, what you've learned to, of these beings being? That's a good question. Um, years ago, Jacques Vallée, you hear uh, George and I talk about him a lot, astrophysicist from France, the godfather of ufology. In his book, Invisible College, he talks about that same thing happening, a guy that can meditate and make these things show up. He brought the guy to the Pentagon, and out of the window, uh, I think it was a colonel or something, the, the guy made a UFO show up, and it's in his book. Well, um, I happen to know a guy that can do that, and, and I'm hoping and have every reason to believe that he will be in the documentary and he'll do it for us. And this is a kid, I think he's like 22 years old. He uh, lives in Los Angeles and he goes out every Sunday and makes these orbs appear because these things, just these little machines, just drones or whatever, just sit there and wait for somebody to do that, that meditation protocol. And then it, it senses the frequency of somebody wanting to see it. And then it, it decloaks itself for people to see. But this kid does it every Sunday. I've met him before, and I've seen um, all of the, the videos of because they video it every time they go out. It's, it's, it's crazy. Um, so when I went camping, you know, my experience was so odd, and I've read, like I, I said earlier, I've read about it before. Um, and I, what do I think it was? Yeah, I definitely think it was something to do with with this entire phenomenon. Absolutely, it was. It, I mean, but only, you know, somebody else witnessed it with me. The other person slept right through it. But um, I think there's something to do with meditation and the way that the brain uh, works when you meditate that has something to do with this phenomenon. There's, there's, you know, we have a tendency to call it interdimensional, or we have a tendency to call it um, supernatural, but really. You know, if you if we look up and we see a bunch of stars in the sky, but if we put on really expensive night vision goggles, you'll see like millions of more stars. It, 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 that's not supernatural. It's just a lot of light that your eyes can't pick up. It's all still there. This phenomenon is a very just real. It's machines. It's with you know living things in these machines, and they're doing very physical things. They just move very fast. And they uh, they might be a bit invisible because of the way their the machine works. So, um, but the whole thing with consciousness, you know, I posed a really interesting question to my advisor, one of the ten advisors I have, uh, about a week ago when they found uh, gravity. I thought about it for a little bit, and then I sent a, a, a message where I said, "Is gravity consciousness? Is that what gravity is?" You know, the one thing that binds the universe together, but it's also the hardest thing to detect, but the most powerful thing there is. You know, maybe we, it's the exact same thing. And so uh, when they found gravity and announced it in, in the press, I got a very specific communication from the advisors that said, this is going to open up doors for you. And when I think about consciousness and meditating and these things popping up and gravity having something to do with how they fly around, whatever, there's something really interesting about that, and it's all coming out. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of high level interest in in exactly those topics. It sounds uh, crazy and exotic, but it's uh, some of the brightest people that I know are thinking exactly along those lines. Uh, we're going to go to the wild card two line, Robert in Baltimore. Hi, Robert. Uh, Tom. Uh, George, uh, what you said before about uh, the uh, about the impact on people is very very significant. I think it can be a, a very great impact. But the key issue here, Tom, is not your covering of new information. In fact, everything you have talked about tonight, I have heard from many other sources because I listen to this stuff quite a bit. There are hundreds of books on UFOs. Uh, Linda Moulton Howe has herself made maybe a, o over a hundred videos that are available on the internet. There are many hundreds of others. In regard to what you just talked about, with regard to the meditation uh, and the what amounts to uh, stimulating the pineal gland, so that the telepathic capabilities of the human is 
are more stimulated. Uh, Stephen Greer now has groups all around the Earth who are doing this kind of thing, and they can call up the UFOs when they would like to have them come, and they, they, they are doing that. And there are many videos about that available. Uh, there, are, there are, I counted 500 videos on the Internet availability on YouTube. Uh, in do you have a question for Tom? Robert, do you have yeah, a question? My, my question is, do you realize that 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 isn't the issue? Most of the things you've talked about are already uh, very well known, and I suspect that you may not be aware uh, that the the question is letting the public see it. And there have been 10 or 15 movies that have done exactly what you're trying to do, but the public doesn't get to see them except occasionally on cable TV, like The Hidden Hand is one movie that, that comes to mind, but there are, there are another 10. You, I don't know whether you've had the time to look at all of these other things, uh, but how so, Robert, you... I'm going to ask you one more time. Do you have a okay. question for Tom? Okay, yeah, my question is, how are you getting, going to get any better distribution of your material, which uh, I believe is the same as we've seen, uh, to the public any more than they're getting now? They, the cable uh, companies have turned off all of the uh, UFO shows. They've been, dis- uh, they've been taken off of all of the on-demand. Uh, do you think you're going to get distribution? Can you stop the CIA from blocking distribution and the the men in black from? All right, let's let's hear what he uh, let's hear the answer. Thank you, Robert. Thanks for the question. No, I, I appreciate uh, everything that he said. I I know of all the videos. I speak to Linda Howe all the time, not all the time, but quite a number of times. Um, I I know a lot of the researchers. I've read all the hundreds of books out there, so I'm very familiar with uh, everything he's talking about or, you know, uh, everything you, sir, have been talking about. The difference with my project now is basically you're asking, you know, what information am I giving that isn't already out there? And the second thing is how am I going to get my stuff out there and have it not be shut down or how am I going to get it out there on a large level? Um, the stuff that is being given to me of who they are and w- what they're doing and why it's being kept secret and what pieces are connected to it the difference is, is I'm getting direct answers about specific things. And all this stuff exists out there in some form, but nobody knows how to traverse the information and pull out what's fact. Nobody knows. You can go out there and read 200 books, but all you have is 200 book, books worth of information, and you have not a damn clue what any of it, if it's fact or not. What I'm doing is getting the very big answers or questions answered. And then I'm taking that, and then the, the second part of, the, of what you asked was, how am I going to get it out there? Well, I'm just, because of what I've done for a living and who I'm represented by and how I work within the entertainment industry, I'm just able to do it at a different level. And the fact that I'm working with these people in the government, I'm able to bring something that's of extreme and different value to entertainment companies, to studios, to production companies. And um, and it goes a long way. Uh, what we haven't said is the docu series that I am doing about how I met these guys and the information that I'm going to be telling people in the entire project. We are doing with a major network, and I can't announce who that is just yet. But I think that's going to help give the kind of stamp of credibility that everybody's going to hope this this project has. I guess uh, maybe where Robert was heading with that question was whether if they pull the rug out from under you, they could somebody could change their mind. Well, they could, and and um, you you know as well as I, and some of our offline conversations is you know we're playing with something that's much bigger than us, and um, and we got to be respectful, and we we got to be careful. But you know, my story here is that. Um, once people know what's going on, it, there, there's no one's going to be vilifying anything that they've done. They're going to they're going to want to help, and uh, I, I I think that they need to. I'm I'm thinking that the very first thing I was told at NASA was this is a very per- good time for this. This is a quote very very good time for this project. So I'm 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 sensing good things. Well, that's sort of how we started the conversation uh, this evening is the, the idea that somebody has almost like flipped the light switch, that uh, we don't exactly know for sure why it's a good time. But I'm glad that uh, we're able to talk about it. And uh, in a moment, we'll open up the phone lines again after the break. 
and uh, take more of your questions and comments from my guest Tom DeLong here on Coast to Coast AM. The Beatles' Tomorrow Never Knows, the final track of an amazing album released 50 years ago this year. It's called Revolver. We're talking with Tom DeLong. One segment remains. The phone lines look pretty full. So, folks, uh, when I call on you, uh, let's get right to it so we can be uh, courteous with the rest of the folks who are waiting to ask their questions or make their comments. One segment remains. Stay with us. Our final segment with Tom DeLong. We're going to J.J. in Washington State. Hi, J.J. You're on with Tom. Hi, George. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Uh, Tom, it's an honor to talk to you. I've been listening to your music for about 20 years, seen you in concert a bunch of times, and a uh, uh, real fan of yours, and uh, looking forward to what you're working on right now. So uh, my question is, uh, you've mentioned China Lake a couple times, uh, you're going out there and whatnot, and um, I- I'm familiar with the area. I have some connections there uh, myself. Uh, but I'm just curious because uh, your former bandmate, Mark Hoppus, is originally from Ridgecrest, California, right there next to it. And if I understand right, uh, his father used to work there at China Lake. So I was just wondering, uh, did he ever make mention of any kind of uh, secret stuff that he was working on there, or did that kind of spark your interest early on uh, from like your interest in uh, UFOs and all that stuff? That's a that's a, a, a pretty Great question, and I applaud you for knowing that detail. Yeah, he is from out there, and his dad worked on some uh, some incredible um, special access programs. I tried to pry into that box a couple of times, got denied. <laughs> so that was, that was early on. I, maybe my pitch wasn't so good, um, but uh, he definitely is somebody um, that worked at, on some really cool stuff. I would add that uh, China Lake, at least from – based on what people have told me, has a lot of really interesting uh, connections to this particular topic and to Area 51. Some of the same people go back and forth, but um, I can't quote any specifics on it. Thanks for the call, though, J.J. We're going to try a first-time caller, Jeannie, in Austin, Texas. Hi, Jeannie. Hi, guys. Uh, Tom, I just wanted to tell you that unless your show is like on Showtime HBO, I would feel like you were being censored and I I wouldn't have any interest in it. I mean, I know that... I don't know how else to say. Maybe I'm the cynical, you know, part of all this. And then second thing I want to tell you is why are you alive and you were given the opportunity when filmmakers like James Allen, who I personally think was killed when he got too close to finding out information about anti-gravity vehicles and was doing a documentary, I, I don't get it. That's my well, I appreciate my it. Um, you know, it's funny. I'm already in the middle of meeting those same networks that you're talking about and i ho- and i hope that we can end up in a place as elevated like that it's a it's a whole new frontier um in television and film there's a lot of different places uh, you know, never would have thought a place like amazon would have been one of the best networks to be on no one you, you never would have thought netflix would have been um now showtime's kind of considered cooler and sometimes at hbo and hbo is the coolest thing for a while it's just it constantly changes so i'm i'm pretty confident we'll end up somewhere and we're good. As far as, you know, why was I given this? I, I, I touched on this a little bit earlier in the show, but it's a super important question. Uh, number one, you know, I have access to these people because of what I do for a living. And so as long as I don't mention the whole UFO thing, um, I can pretty much meet whoever. Uh, but once I get in there, I'm very respectful um, and I'm very uh, passionate and I'm very knowledgeable about the subject. You, um, what you might not have heard earlier is that I presented a thesis that made its way through the DOD that that in turn got me uh, a meeting with someone that was deep in intelligence out um, in Washington, D.C. So it was that thesis and the kind of academic nature of it that got people interested in talking to me not only because of who I was, but because I seemed to have, um, you know, uh, an elevated knowledge Grasp. of the subject matter matter and then after that the main reason why they continued to work with me and and really gathered around and supported the project is because i executed in a way on many different things that um are frankly pretty hard to do and <clears throat> over a year and a half the way i've done that uh, releasing everything step by step and gathering all these different people from different places in the government uh, and bringing them all together and holding very high-level meetings, like very high-level meetings between Washington, D.C. and the people that I'm working with. I think all these things combined really created 
um, just a canvas for something new to happen. And uh, but I do understand it. I I get that people are like, why you? You're like you play in a band. Like how did you do this? Well, you know, it's a long, it's kind of a long story, but uh, that's why the docu the docu series that will be coming out will be explaining this in more detail. And I guess the I, the answer to the question why he hasn't been killed is because uh, Tom is doing something with their okay at the moment. And whether or not anybody else has been killed um, for getting too close to the secret, I, I, you know, I'm not quite sure about that. But thank you for the call, Jeannie. We're going to go west of the Rockies. Uh, Ernest. Hi, Ernest. You're on with Tom DeLong. Hey, George. Thanks for taking my call. Hello, Mr. DeLong. And I'm, I'm with some of the other ones. Let me just say this first. You keep saying religious wars. I you know, I think that was the end, what, 1600s? But anyway, uh, you, you know, you say, you, how do you know you're not being used as disinformation, first of all? And the second of all, if these aliens crashed, you know, that just shows that they're, they're uh, fallible. They can make mistakes. And uh, Bill, I think he was on your show, George. Uh, uh, Bill, uh, he did the UFO show, and he said that he was uh, – and, and somebody's lying then, because that sheriff who came up on that cattle mutilation said that he saw a human head and a hand in that cow. And Bill said it was because he got too close taking uh, pictures from the hotel room of airplanes flying into uh, Area 51 or, uh, and he was taking those serial numbers, and somebody told him that he was getting too close to these uh, uh, uh bov you know bovine serum is close to human serum and he said that uh that uh, he was getting really too close and he upset people that to, i think to quote him he said that were bigger than you meaner than you or, or and, and ugly okay and well let's let's uh, you've asked uh, several questions let's uh, give tom a, a chance to tackle them uh, first one was about how do you know you're not being used for disinformation well I, because of the conditions of how i met these people, how I brought them together, and the way the relationship works, uh, and these are not, I know exactly who they are, I know their full bios, um, I know their current positions, and they're not counterintelligence um, people. Uh, you it, sought it, them it out, were, right. It, 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 should, it would just be a different situation if, I was, if, I, if they were different people. Um, the second thing is, uh, you know, about the, the religious wars, there still are religious wars going on, obviously, today. And um, and based on people's very very deep belief systems, we're, we're uh, we've been over in the Middle East for a very long period of time, and there's some really horrible things that are going on uh, over there. But um, you know, and then you know, mentioning UFOs being fallible, that might be the case. They might be fallible, or they might be crashing uh, on purpose. Um, the way it's been explained to me is that either um, by accident or by design the effect of those crashes is giving greater weapons of war to the people that are fighting each other here on the planet, meaning our country against this country or, or our country you know, against this group that has this belief system. And, um, and that is what they're looking at. You know, they, they, it's not so much you know, uh, how it crashed. It's, it's more like, well, what are the effects of it? And, um, and I think that's what makes this a little bit more scary. And on the point of cattle mutilations, I, I don't think your your group is saying that all cattle mutilations are carried out by aliens or the others. Uh, we've we've had some discussions about the program before that there might be other folks who are operating under the umbrella of that stuff, very human people who are carrying out similar kind of operations for their own purposes. But did you get any insight onto the cattle mutilation stuff? I and, and yes, I did. Um, but I go in for very specific people. Once again, I think. You know, people are going to be very, very emotional about all this stuff, especially if you spent your whole life reading all of the conspiracy stuff out there about UFOs, and you think you have the full picture because you read all these books or all the websites, and you're absolutely sure that this is how it is because I saw this weird website that talked about this one thing. Um, I'm not out to prove that this stuff's real. I'm out to tell people uh, answers to very specific questions. So when it comes to the cattle mutilations, I go and I ask a very specific question about the cattle mutilations, and I get a very specific answer. Yes, it is the UFO phenomenon doing it. But I don't go in there and say, well, how many are real? Or when, you, when they find gas masks, are you guys dropping those off just to, like, make people think it's all human so no one gets scared? Or, you know, I don't, I don't get into all those details. I, these, these people 
um, they're too important to deal with my laundry list of thousands of other questions that I wish I could ask. East of the Rockies, John in St. Louis. Hi, John. You're on with Tom. Good morning. Good morning, George. Good morning, Tom. It's very interesting. A long-time listener. Um, I got a comment and then a question, and and I'll try to make it quick. The the comment is is that my worldview. This all does uh, make sense. Things seem to be different phenomena seem to be tied together, and it seems like a catch me if you can. You know, I'm over here. No, I'm over here. You know, like a, they're fooling with mankind. And my worldview is that first of all, life is a miracle. Einstein said as much. Um, you know, there's a spiritual world. Uh, we just celebrated Easter. Here you have a man in history that it's no doubt he's the most famous one person in the entire world. He defied the laws of physics, uh, all the miracles he did. He defied the laws of physics, doing all these miracles. Okay, he could do it because he wrote the laws of physics. And I think the Bible explains, uh, has a lot to do with uh, what we see about the UFOs. There's that famous Italian painting with the two aerodynamic things chasing in the background with the crucifixion with the three on, on Calvary. So there's a lot of mystery to it. But the Bible does say that in the end time that Satan has the power of the air, that it is demonic, and the whole big picture is is they're trying to deceive mankind. Okay, John, I'm going to have to ask you to get to the question part okay, of it. Okay, the question is, is what does he think about that? And also, what does he say? I believe Tom is very sincere on this, but you know, there's a lot of movies and books and all this stuff is for profit. And that's a red flag whenever that you delve into that, because there's a money motivation. I'm not okay, we're going to let hear what he has to say about that. Well, I think, number one, um, the Bible is a very, very important book in all of this stuff, as so are a lot of other religious books that are out there. I think that um, that when you when you look into the way religions uh, have written text, you know, how, how the text points to gods in the sky with their various vehicles and, you know, what they're doing and how the world got created and all these different things. I think it's, I think everyone's talking about the same stuff, um, the way it's been explained to me. And, and I know a lot of, you know, I was raised like a lot of suburban kids were going to church every Sunday. My mom was a very religious lady. She was a Christian. My household was kind of split down the middle, but I'm very familiar with, with the Christian religion. That was a, a major part of my life. Uh, I'm not with that faith anymore, but I understand what the Bible is, and I understand, you know, what it means to people. Um, but I, but what's interesting is, is I moved away from it for many years, and when I got deeper into this subject matter, it seemed to make a lot more sense to me. Um, I'm from a different belief system that mankind has created the religions, but the stories are very important. The stories are saying something, and they're all saying the same thing about a bunch of people that came here from somewhere else, and there's one group, yes, trying to deceive mankind and hates mankind, and then, you know, there's there's another uh, part of it that doesn't feel that way about man. So, um, but I'm not a religious scholar, but I think there's something that, uh, you know, I've once heard the Bible referred to as, you know, it's uh, a super, it's the guidebook of the supernatural, you know, and I go, well, that might be a better way to call it for someone like me. Um, but coming back to, like, doing things for profit, books and movies, well, yeah, it, it takes, but, you know, if anybody has any cl- clue how much it costs to make a movie, you know, think about the show House of Cards. You're like, oh, it's a TV show. It costs $100 million dollars. When uh, to make 20 episodes, 100 million dollars. So the only way you can make something that speaks internationally to that many people on that level, you need to to be able to create something that is compelling enough for someone to say, I'm going to put $100 million into that television episode or that one movie, and then I'm going to put in another $100 million to market that. So how the hell are we going to get back $200 million? It's a big big business it's a very complex business and um and but it happens to do it happens to be our biggest export as a country so i i'm doing it the best i can but uh it, it's just the reality and the economics of how entertainment works you know i guess we could all work for free you know and then uh, it wouldn't cost anything you know if everybody agreed to work for free um who's in i'll see a, a show of hands we're gonna try the international line dave in toronto hi dave 
speak with you both. And um, Tom, I think you're right on the money. One of my best contributions so far in this fight on the uh, battlefield earth uh, so far has been to put out a series of books about uh, deep underground military bases and repelling an alien invasion of the greys. And I, I make a nod in my books to the Gnostic myths of the Archons. Are these others you're talking about, the Archons, or uh, I've also heard you reference it could be the Anunnaki. I just wanted you to maybe speak to that a little bit. And have you heard anything about benevolent aliens as well? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. You, you, thank you so much, because what you just said is, is you're, you're hitting it right on the money. There are massive programs underground and in other places to create a global defense system. Uh, largely, a lot of it was done in the 80s. The SDI, the Reagan Star Wars Defense Initiative, was part of it. Um, and we were doing that in collaboration with uh, the Soviet Union. A lot of people thought we were at each other's throats, which we kind of were, but we were also working with them in certain parts of their government on the whole SDI system. And I think that was a lot, a lot of that is, is what led to Reagan and Gorbachev getting along and, and, and forming some type of a friendship there. But um, the other thing that you said, bringing up the Anunnaki and all that stuff, the way it was explained to me is, yes, there are good gods and bad gods and their interactions with humanity has been um, well documented all the way back through Greek myth and then even further back into the, the, the Sumerian legends that are out there. I actually have communications that are detailing very specific leaders within um, Sumer and within uh, ancient Greece, very specific people that I am being told to communicate that were, that were given types of information from these gods you know it's it's insane i i don't to think about that i i don't have all the details i have very specific things i'm supposed to do and say and there's certain questions i have to ask to get more information because it's going to be a very short discussion for me just to say what i've been told and not have anything else to go on um there i think the point to really take from all of this is that those stories are true from the perspective of the people that wrote them, you know, so they they differ in different in different areas of the world a little bit. You know, they call the gods different names, or or they or they um, you know, they they side with different gods. Um, but the idea that there, right now there's three monotheistic faiths, and the, the rivalry between them is by design. Period. Uh, a communication that I had. Um, a few weeks ago was it was is that human beings have a tendency to organize around religious belief systems as long as there is a priestly class quote unquote meaning that human beings will align behind different religions as long as there is a leader of that religion that they can that they can kind of call their hero and um, and our government has known that and they're actively trying to come up with a campaign to get people to understand that and not fall into that deception. Thanks to all the callers. Uh, Tom, I appreciate you being here. I, I guess this was the rollout. I, it was. You know, I, we have uh, the Rolling Stone article is going to launch on the 8th. Uh, Secret Machines novel is in all the bookstores on the 5th. The docuseries is going to launch after that. Um, I'm trying my hardest to get good information to everybody. Um, I'm not going to get told everything. But the stuff that I have been told is just unreal and uh, makes me excited. I think, uh, I think the, the people within the DOD are doing some incredible work, and it's, it's damn time they, they get some what they deserve, which is some credit. Tom DeLong, thanks very much for being here. And uh, if your advisors are listening tonight, uh, I hope there's more to come. Uh, thank you also to A.J. Hartley, who was with us earlier, and to my colleagues at uh, Coast Jeff Duray. G. Lee, Dan Galati, our webmaster, Lex, and Chris Boros, the producer. Good night, everyone.